Welcome to November's meeting. We're live broadcasting to three or four people online and recording. So uh, tonight's presentation uh, is Charlie Van Buvel. He's going to talk about uh, vitiligenin and pronounce it correctly tonight. in a few minutes. Um, just remind you, membership includes Swarm List, Bee Buddy Program, Bee Days at the Apiary, Katie's Library, a bunch of books, equipment rental. And in December, we have elections and we're uh, looking for a new vice president and adding the position of volunteer, of uh, sorry, fundraising uh, to, the, uh, to the board. And we're uh, moving the APR manager. And if you want to, if you have questions about that, uh, Janet will talk to you about that. Or she's open to discussing it. So, December, we've got elections and honey tasting. January, we have How Bees Use Sound and Vibration by Paul Longwell. And February is Dead Bees Don't Make Honey by Teresa Martin. And the next year, thanks to Brian and the team, the schedule is packed and it's great. Don't forget to learn the APRA first and third Sundays. The swarm list is going strong, although not a lot going on now. And with that, I'd like to introduce Charlie Van and Hupel, and I'll let him introduce himself with his own bio. You're not going to read this? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. I'm going to take all my clothes. You don't mind, do you? <laughs> so, uh, I, uh, can I just stand right up here? You there? can. And uh, camera. Earlier, with, uh, she, uh, he copied the bio off my website. So, I thought I'd talk a little about that. Uh, way back uh, when I was just knee high to a grasshopper, uh, my dad had built his or constructed his house and I faced uh, into Mexico. We got to see the uh, copper mines when they poured the slag every night. That was pretty spectacular. Uh, anyway, he had uh, dug through the foundation and he uh, planted. I think three or four bougainvillea vines. Does anybody not know what bougainvilleas are? You don't? Rather a huge flower, kind of reddish, purplish, and inside the house. And uh, I would sit on the couch and I'd watch the bees come up to the screen door and they would sit there, sometimes hours before somebody would open the door. Uh, and then they come in and they would get their pollen and their nectar. And then they go back to the screen door and wait a length of time before somebody would open the door. If we had a cat, and if the cat went up the door right off, somebody would open it, but apparently not for the bees. But it's pretty fascinating to watch these guys coming day after day after day the drive to get the nectar in the blood. So uh, I then uh, left uh, El Paso and joined the Navy. And it wasn't until about 15 or so years ago that I finally got back to the beekeeping. And so here I am. So with that, we are going to talk about uh, vitiligen. So uh, when we uh, you guys may know something about anatomy of a bee uh, to some degree, but what we're going to talk about tonight is the physiology. So uh, hopefully uh, when I get done, you'll have some understanding. Hopefully I don't hurt myself up too much. So vitiligenin uh, is abbreviated VG. It's an egg yolk protein and uh, expressed in the thorax and also in the head in the bee. That's where it's kind of manufactured. Uh, and then it resides in the fat bodies. Go ahead. So uh, that's a queen, in case anybody doesn't know, with uh, laying an egg. 
And uh, just like a, a chicken egg, uh, there's the yolk, and the yolk is the food for the chicken. Well, with honeybees, the, uh, the embryo is only 25% of that egg, but 75% is vitiligen. So that embryo, as it's uh, uh, dividing and, and replicating, is consuming the nourishment of vitiligen. Okay, so far so good. All right, the queen begins to synthesize vitiligenin when she's in uh, her cell. So after uh, about 60 hours, about two and a half days, uh, she starts creating this vitiligenin in her uh, body. And then it becomes about 70% of the queen's hemolymph. So the hemolymph is the blood supply for uh, bees. I don't know why they call it hemolymph. Maybe uh, Dewey can expose on it next month, but uh, they do a lot of funny things, you know, when we're talking about insects or humans. All right. So I thought we would step back a little bit. Uh, I don't know if you guys are really into anatomy and physiology, but uh, when we're talking about humans, we have white blood cells and we have red blood cells. Everybody aware of that? Okay. And uh, the white blood cells, I'm not gonna go through each one, but there's actually uh, one, two, three, four, five different white blood cells. And each one is specific to do something within our body. And they're not always present. So it depends on whether we have some disease process going on, cancer or a bacterial infection or a fungus. And so uh, that's when they really begin to populate our body to combat all that. All right. The next thing is the liver. So I'm sure everybody knows that we have a liver and the liver does uh, several different uh, things uh, from detoxifying uh, drugs, alcohol, okay? uh, and, uh, and it carries away waste in cholesterol production and so forth and so on. So if you just remember white blood cells and liver, we're now going to get to the NED. So uh, uh, Samuel Ramsey, uh, I think he actually did this. He took a B body. So the B body is that portion where we have the stripes. Okay? And he split it in half. And then you can see the pins to hold it apart. Mm -hmm. And so this, in fact, here is the fat body. Yeah. Please don't get too excited. It's not this kind of fat. Okay. It is actually protein. I don't know why they call it a fat body, like many things that I see, but there we go. So it's just a, a bunch of protein and fat, and it's very similar to our liver. So it filters things, which we we're going to talk about. All right. So uh, and the, the vitiligenin in the fat body takes care of growth, metamorphosis, storage, and energy, uh, pesticide detoxification. Uh, we were having dinner earlier, and someone said their bees had probably died from pesticides. Bees can actually detoxify a, not an onslaught of pesticides, but a mild dose. And then uh, water loss, immune function, temperature regulation, metabolic activity, and then protein and fat synthesis. Okay. So uh, it influences hormones. Uh, it's uh, food related. It uh, builds immunity, stress resistance, and then longevity. All right. So uh, it acts as an immune uh, effectors, uh, killing bacteria, viruses, and antioxidant activity. So I'm going to keep repeating these over and over. Maybe after an hour, you guys will go, oh, I think I know what he's talking about. Yeah. Okay, uh, it does more things. It takes care of the social organization, uh, temporal division of labor, 
uh, foraging specialization, regulation of hormonal dynamics, change in gustatory responses. So here is the vitiligenin, and here are all the little things that that does in that body. So I'm guessing it's a pretty important little subject. Okay. Yeah. That's a fat. fat. What? Fat. What you're talking about there is a fat body. Yeah. The vitiligenin is in the fat body. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So uh, this egg yolk protein. Do you have an earth, please? Oh, you kicked it. Raise your hand. See, I did it. <laughs> Sorry. No, I, it adds to the whole flavor. So uh, uh, it is a nutrition for the nurse bees. Uh, it builds immunity, fighting off pathogens, longevity, uh, and division of labor. Uh, now, the longevity, the, our queens live more than six weeks. So the workers live how long? Six weeks, right? Five, six weeks, depending upon where they're at. Uh, but the queen lives longer. Uh, and the reason she can live longer is vitiligenin. She has a higher level of that vitiligenin to keep her uh, vibrant. Uh, division of labor, I'll talk about that in a second. And, uh, it's, it's dependent upon pollen in order to create it. Because pollen is protein, protein is amino acids. Amino acids is the building block of life. So there's nothing alive today, including us, that doesn't start with amino acids. All right, Can we get past that? All right, so it also deals with stress. So I don't know if you guys have seen something like that, uh, like this in prior uh, presentations, all the different stressors that bees have to put up with, but uh, it takes care of the oxidative stress, cell-based immunity, longevity, and then it transports fragments of pathogen cells into the egg. Yes, sir. Did you change? No. Okay. So when the worker bee is, is hatched, uh, she has a high level of vitiligenin. And as each day goes by, that level of vitiligenin starts to uh, diminish. But what starts to increase is the juvenile hormone. And so there's a flip-flop, right, that goes on here that guides the worker bee from being a nurse bee into being a foraging bee. Is that exciting or what? All right. Okay, so and yeah, that just talks about the different levels uh, from the vitiligenin increases and then the juvenile hormone uh, kind of replaces the vitiligenin. Okay. All right. Uh, it took me a while to sort this out. Uh, it's a bit shocking, but we can't just have vitiligenin. We have vitiligenin A, B, and C. Don't ask me what the difference is. Uh, but as you see in this graph, uh, the vitiligenin A actually is increased in the winter months. And it's the vitiligenin A that, in fact, allows that uh, those bees to elongate their life from mm -hmm. five, six weeks up to six months, mm -hmm. right? Okay. You're doing a great job. All right, so young versus the age. Uh, young queens produce 25, uh, greater than 25% uh, of the vitiligenin, especially in November and January. Uh, you see the blue dots are the young queen and the green dots are the old queen. And you can see the different months and you see that the old queen doesn't have as much vitiligenin as the new queen. So has anybody talked to you guys about requeening? How often should you requeen? Come on, pretty brave. When you get money? <laughs> Huh? I probably do it if I have a queen for two people seasons. 
So every two years. Okay. Anybody do less than that? Every twelve. Every twelve months. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we seem to have a couple of women in here. Uh, you guys don't have any spit wads or anything to throw at me. Uh, day. Uh, it seems that we're having babies older. We have this sense that we want to go out and enjoy life, or maybe we're building a profession, or we're doing whatever. And yet, the closer we get up to 40, the more opportunity we have to have problems with ourselves. I mean, not a woman. Uh, so don't take this as my being a woman. Uh, and for the baby. So by having younger queens, we have a better opportunity to have more vitiligenum in the colony, right? Okay, so uh, there's an outfit uh, way over that way uh, called Helsinki, a uh, pretty uh, expansive uh, university. They do a lot of different research, but uh, a few years ago, they decided to develop a, a B vaccine. So, you know, we take vaccines, smallpox, uh, COVID, flu, all these different vaccines. So what they did is they took uh, American Falcon and they took uh, lots of the bacteria and they added it into sugar and they fed it to queen. So the queen now has developed an immunity and she is then able to transmit that in to her young. So there's a corporation in the US called Dalen, is that right? Yeah, that's trying to move that. And they're looking at other things like viruses, uh, European power et etc. Uh, but right now they're kind of focused at American power. So they're using it in Europe and here. All right. Thoughts. Ah, the winter bee or the fat bee. So the transition from the normal bee, the summer bee, into the winter bee happens, starts happening in about August. So the queen starts laying eggs that have a higher level of vitrogen so that we elongate their life. And uh, and she, she continues to do that because she's got to replace whatever bees were in the hive then, uh, 20, 30,000, they're starting to die off, but she needs to develop about 15,000 to overwinter. And we want nice, strong, vibrant bees to keep the queen alive. I hope it's not shocking to anybody. We don't really care about the workers. Uh, mm -hmm. We care about the queen. And if we don't have the workers, then the queen is gonna die. So has anybody opened up their hive uh, after the winter and found the queen with just a really small number of bees around it? No? No. <coughs> so that's why. Not enough strength to keep queen warm. Okay. So this is kind of the bee year. Starts in January, actually. And... Uh, I think even you guys start to get the blackberry bloom in about May or June. Uh, but once that nectar flow is over, that intense period of, of nectar production in flowers, why then the population starts to decline. Not dramatically, but slowly. So if you look at this, you see this little dotted line, it goes up pretty rapidly because we need to attack the nectar flow. So I call it an army. So an army division uh, has a lot of different battalions. Uh, it has a medical battalion. So the doctors, nurses, all those people are in that. Uh, we have a supply battalion because we need to be able to get supplies. And then we have the uh, gun guys, okay? Then we may have a, a tank battalion and so forth and so on. I, I think about that when I'm thinking about the beehive because it's the same. 
we don't just have worker bees wandering around. We have different duties that the workers are doing. And again, if the hive's not strong enough, then those duties will get done. How many people have uh, had a hive die off from yellow jackets? No? Okay, why? A weak hive. It's a weak hive. Okay. That, that's it. So if you have a weak hive, then you're going to get uh, wax moths, or you're going to get yellow jackets, or you're going to get both. Okay? They don't have enough army to battle those guys. And so they move in. All right. So, whoop, back. Uh, so once we get past the nectar flow, the populations start to decline, and then we start moving into the replacement to create winter bees about August, September. But because the population has gone down, because the varroa mites have been reproducing, it is about this point when we really get high levels of varroa. And that, and then the next step is then the varroa starts vectoring uh, viruses and hives crash in uh, September, October, November. If you didn't happen to go into your hive in October, November, and every beekeeper does, oh gee, it's too cold. And then you go in the spring and go, wow, it was too cold and that's why my bees died. No, it's because they weren't healthy and the virus has got to them and killed them off before the winter even started. All right, next. All right, a uh, nice picture of a hive cluster. So we need a really strong uh, uh, winter hive and we want strong pheromones, okay? Which comes from the detergent. Everything's coming back to that. So here we are. Anybody like this picture? Isn't that cute? Uh, so every hive has varroa mites, and it is the number one killer of honeybees. Two reasons, and I'll show you those, but the ultimate killer really is the viruses. So next. Has anybody seen this picture? Okay, well, I stole this from uh, Samuel Ramsey, but I think a guy in England actually produced this. Uh, so it's an electron microscope uh, here. And I'll show you, here's the mouth parts. Here's these uh, uh, guys there. All right, next picture. All right, oh, one back. Yeah, okay. All right. So we have these two pinchers, okay, that stab into the larva or uh, into the bee itself to kind of hold on. And then its mouth, the yellow part here, can then consume. Mites can't eat solids. So what they do is they regurgitate their saliva. Is that disgusting? Into you're okay. Okay. Reminds me of the spider. Huh? Kind of like spider. Yeah. Or a mosquito. Okay, I'm showing mosquito just so they regurgitate the saliva, which liquefies the fat tissue, and then they can suck up that fatty tissue. It's now kind of a liquid form. All right, next. Now, I heard this from Samuel Ramsey. You see this guy here that I pointed the arrow to? I personally like that. It's a snorkel. Having served on submarines, I thought that was pretty cool. So the bromite on day eight or nine jumps into the brood cell and hides underneath the larva on its back. And it can stick that snorkel up and then that's the way it breathes. But it's kind of laying in that liquid. Uh, now, there is a question. We're dumping mitocytes in, like oxalic acid. What if this guy can hold his breath? Maybe our treatment's not cool. So I think that's a question we need to ask. 
All right, next. So here's the other thing that Samuel Ramsey taught us is these dots, 60%, 21, five, four, is the percentage of mites that he found on bees. So when I got back into beekeeping 15 or so years ago, why uh, the old time beekeepers, I was young back then, uh, said, hey, I saw a mite, so I need to treat. Well, when you see that mite on top, the hive's already gone. Yeah. The reason is, is that the mites are getting into the interspaces between the body. So every color in the body, you could literally just separate those, you'd probably kill the bee, but yet there's a space there for that uh, grow mite to get in between. And that's where it grabs a hold with his claws and then is able to suck at the fat body, All right? And so you'll see the red dot here, that's where the dominant share of them are in our bees. So unless you're turning your bees over, you're not gonna see the, okay. Okay, done. Oh, oh we down to the video. All right. <laughs> Triple A labs mite is a little bit smaller. Uh, it, uh, well, the Broa mite started in Southeast Asia. It was on the uh, Serana B. We have different uh, uh, sex species. species. Yeah, I didn't take biology up there. Uh, we have different species of bees. So the African and the Serenas in Southeast Asia, and somehow. Somebody decided to move in the uh, Melifera, which is what we have here, the European bee. And the next thing you know is that the rural mite jumped over onto the uh, European bee. <laughs> so, uh, and and the Serena bee actually had gotten to the point where it could kind of deal with the mite. But then lo and behold, we got this tropole lapse. So a regular mite uh, jumps into the brood cell, lays on its back, waits for the brood cell to be uh, capped over. And then uh, on the 21st day, the bee hatches and we get one mother and one daughter. It takes time for the eggs to mature into adults. There'll be some immature, but about one adult and one uh, daughter. With uh, 
the trophal and and they emerge, and then it takes uh, four, five, six days before that daughter jumps into another brood cell. So the, the process is not very quick. The tropa lay laps apparently isn't as nice. And so it literally emerges from the cell and turns around and jumps into the next cell. And so they replicate very quickly and they destroy hives very quickly. They're not here yet. Is that what you're gonna answer? But, I just saw where they had moved into Georgia. So you can look that up on the map and in between Turkey and Russia and some other country. So they are starting to march uh, west. So when I say they're not here yet, they're not gonna be here. Uh, all right, so here's a picture of a mosquito and mosquitoes uh, bite us and they inject some blood into us that they've got, and then they suck it back out. And in doing that, that's how we get uh, all the different viruses that come from mosquitoes, right? All right. So if you haven't come upon this pamphlet yet, I highly recommend take a picture of it, write it down, but this is everything you ever want to know about Aurora. Uh, and you don't have to print it. Uh, you can just read right through it. Right in the middle of that pamphlet is a very nice uh, chart that says, okay, dormant, uh, population increase, uh, peak, and then population decrease. Okay? And it tells you which mitocide is best for that period of time. So don't just randomly go, wow, uh, don't be like the gardener and go to the uh, hardware store and go, wow, that's a pretty bottle, and bring it home and dump half the bottle on you. Okay. Uh, you need to do a little bit better. Okay, that's good. So now we're going to talk about nutrition. There are two kinds of nutrition, honey and pollen. That's all the bees thrive on. All right. So one of the things that was kind of hard for me when I was examining hives, you know, I'm looking for the queen, maybe I'm looking at uh, uh, babies. Uh, quite frankly, I had no idea what I was looking at. But uh, this is a brood brain. And when you're looking at it, you're not supposed to laugh. Uh, when you're looking at a brood frame, you should see honey or nectar from here up over and all the way down. And then in between the honey and the brood should be pollen. So if you don't see that food source available on your brood uh, frame, then you have a problem and you need to solve it. So you need to put a pollen patty in there, you need to give them sugar syrup, you need to do something to help them out because the environment's not supplying it for them. Okay, next. All right, here's the larva. So a larva has two anatomical parts, anatomical parts, mouth and the midgut. So the midgut is where it processes nutrition and gets it into the larva. It's an eating machine. From the day four, when it transitions into the larva until day nine, it is it has eaten 10,000 times. Because once the cell is capped, there's no more nutrition being added. And so it has to survive off of whatever nutrition was in there. All right, so if you look at this frame, you see the larva and you see that white substance, okay? If you don't see that liquid beneath them, go to the next one. Uh, yeah, the next one. Uh, you see, we don't see a lot of that white liquid there. One more, maybe? Yeah. And so these cells are not being nourished because you don't see any nectar or pollen on that frame. Okay, next. 
Uh, oh, this is another picture of dry stuff. Okay, good. But huh, here's another pamphlet free of charge. Uh, do you pay charge you, but I won't. Okay. Go out to the same website, the Honeybee Health Coalition, and you can get best management practices for high health. How many pages is that? Like 60? Yeah, it's, it's a pretty big uh, pamphlet, and it goes through a lot of different things. Uh, one of them is nutrition. It's well worth the read. And if you read it once, if you're like me, you probably want to read it more often because my brain's kind of slow and I read things and then I forget them. Okay, yes. All right, so keeping bee colonies healthy is really challenging. Some seasons are going to be tough. Bee colonies will also need to be tough. One more. But for every complex problem, this is for you, uh, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. <laughs> so if you've been a beekeeper for more than a year, you're going to scratch your head a lot. Uh, I could show you where I don't have any hair uh, from scratching it too much. Uh, sometimes we just don't know the answer, but don't leave it at that. Really try to figure out what happened to these organs. Okay, is it nutrition? Is it mites? Is it viruses? And if you don't know, find somebody that. Okay, because beekeeping really is a learning experience. And if you're just going to keep bees and they're going to die every year, uh, thank you for buying them. Appreciate that, but that doesn't seem to be the right thing. You're always going to have the highest die for whatever reason, but you need to know why so that you can learn. Okay, so uh, Dewey loves my little stool. So, you know, when you look at stressors, we talk about insecticides, we talk about this, we talk about that. The reality is there's only three major categories that really affect the bee. So nutrition, varroa, and the beekeeper. Beekeepers kill a lot of bees. All right. So it's really important that bees have vitiligenin. So vitiligenin is going to come about from good nutrition. If the bees have good nutrition, they will produce vitiligenin. We need to be able to look at varroa damage. We need to think about our queens. We need good, vibrant queens. And then we need good nutrition. Oh. All right. Now you can ask every question in the world. Yes. Yeah, that, um, that mite. What does it mean that mite? Trophilae labs. Is that the one? Yeah. Yeah. Now, is it? It's not here. But will it be controlled with the miticide? Uh, I think the only miticide is the formula. That's the only one. So far. Well, there's uh, Andy Ramsey went crazy running around the country trying to get some money as he kind of started it. Now, I think there's probably 30, 40, 50 each models over there trying to tackle this thing, different uh, aspects. It's like uh, we just need to think about disease. Okay? Uh, diseases do. Uh, we didn't have low or uh for 1987. And then some gave him decided to bring some bees in that happened to have low mite. He didn't know that, but he brought them in outside the US. They didn't get checked, and now in the four years. We learned more for the low mite. And when we took away last year, it's still in the So they're worse because it was multiplied. We're going to literally come out of the city and check in with us. So we really don't have a chance to get out because we don't have a chance to get out because we don't have a chance to get out because we don't have a chance to get out because we don't have a chance to get out because we don't have a chance to get out because we don't have a chance to get out 
from this one from Daniel. Does OA vapor work because the mite breeds it or because it allows the mite to be covered in OA? OA, oxalic acid. Oxalic acid. Yeah. Uh, and the answer to that question is we don't. Shockingly enough, we have mitocytes attacking the mite, and we're not totally sure what they do. Another one from Daniel, it's more of an observation. Canada is importing queens from Ukraine and USSR, so it's only it's only time before they have the new mite, and then so will the US. That's probably true. There are some in uh, Eastern Russia, uh, I don't think the Ukraine's got it yet, but Georgia does, and that's not too far. This stuff travels pretty quickly. I think in the stuff imports as well as when they discovered that. Carl? On the middle of the in the queen, you said the levels are higher when we enter. Correct. How does the, the lessening of the levels that affect the high as we get like a one-year one year queen and a five-year queen. Uh, well, uh, I don't think we have any five-year queens. I just threw that number out there. But uh, the difference between the uh, first-year queen and the second-year queen is they're not producing as much And so that affects everything. Yeah, the chart of all the factors that affects is massive. Yeah. It's kind of like taking away all the levels. Anybody have any feeling? Uh, <laughs> are you a nurse? Because uh, the leukemia is attacking the white blood cells. So uh, it's kind of uh, like that. Where is the doctor? Anybody else have to worry about it? Anybody have a gun? Mm -hmm. Right. That answer? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't seem like a very important thing to be talking about here, but it's critical to the entire life. And I don't, we can't go down the store and buy it. And so we have to make sure the nutrition is there. How do you know you have the right to Look at the bridge, right? Okay, you have that. Okay. Yeah. So, for all mites' origin was from the aging species that they cohabitate. And yeah, they. And they, they, these aren't native to the U.S. Why haven't we just switched over to the other species at least? That's a great idea. So you're going to kill off all the uh, European bees and go to the serenity? They're not native. Huh. Well, uh, when you bring a new species in, uh, there's going to be other issues because their climate is different from ours. So that's one issue. Uh, I don't remember the other, but there are multiple issues. I mean, people have thought about that, but it just doesn't make sense. Do uh, we may throw me out of here? Uh, all the uh, the treatments that we're giving against the red light are external. So I want you to think about uh, just putting the salve on. Okay? If you put an antibiotic salve on, it's okay if you have an infection of the skin, but what if it's people? Does it take care of it? No. And so what we really need to do, we need to get some really smart entomologists who can figure out how to get a mitocide that will reside in the fatty tissue so that when the mite eats the fatty tissue, it dies. So I liken it to the uh, sick medicine for a dog or a cat. You never need any uh, probably through sugar, just like they're feeding sugar with uh, 
American Val Bridge and the Queen. So where the Romans are found, yeah. there was significant asymmetry inside that much higher involvement in the other side. Is there any the building? Oh, it's not the mountain. Yeah, but it's mostly the belly. Okay. It's in those segments of the belly, but we don't see them because we're only looking at the back. We then they move the side essentially they're in their most interspersal. Okay. Uh, we got a couple time for two more questions. Is it eight oh five yet? In class. Okay. <laughs> what stimulates the queen to lay a, a start laying winter bees? Was it the higher uh, the are so cute. I like petting them. And so we put them into our own hives. And um, sometimes they don't have all the resources that they would have had. So again, we, be, we really need to look at the bird plants. Don't look for the queen. Don't look for the queen. Just look at the bird plants and make sure that we have the bird plants. Do we care about the trees? There's a queen here in Canada. We want to look at the larvae and we'll make sure it's really like right um, the honey and um, yeah. okay. well, the yeah. okay. On the larva? Yeah. Yeah, we just yellow right there. Okay. So it transitions from the yellow to brown to black. We didn't have the most we were talking about. You know, the American cowboy. I don't think we see black very often. So they're way past on that. Well, why is the water not going to I What? Uh, even though you don't have young babies, uh, what are babies do all the they what? Sleep. Eat and what? Sleep. And clean? Yeah. 
<laughs> they eat, they poop, and they cry. Yes. And so the honeybee larva emits a brood pheromone every two seconds and says, feed me, feed me, feed me, so that the nurse bees can come over and keep. Well, a larva has a mouth. Has a mouth and it has a mid gut. Okay, like your large intestine. Doesn't have a rectum, it doesn't have a uh, foregut, which would be the entire problem. Is that all about what's it sell? Once it caps and it is in the fetal stage, then it is in the water. Okay. Any other questions? I went over time, so I'll give you Great question. Uh, you can take my email address. Um, yeah, and feel free to send me an email and ask questions. And where are you at? Good mm -hmm. If you start in El Paso, you know, it's good. What's the name of that bar? The bar in Hood River? The White House? No, the Pugabilia. Oh, the flower. Oh, the flower uh, was. Uh, what did you think? Bougainvillea. It's a South American plant. And it grows in vines. And uh, I'm told that uh, the man of the house uh, grows them. And like an trellis up towards his daughter's room because they have. Uh, uh, spine bone mm -hmm. to keep the boy from drinking up the river. Does that work? Yes. Yeah. It does work? <laughs> I heard it doesn't. They've got the spine. Yeah, they do. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think I got it. Okay, I'm heading home. Yeah. That was so Thank you very much, Charlie. That was excellent.